All right, let's go. Um, hello, I'm Becca Gershkoviak. I'm with the Tea Smith. Uh, we're a tea company here in Omaha, Nebraska. We've been around since late 2004, so this is going to be our 20th anniversary. I know, right? Uh, Tim's around here somewhere with the uh, uh, Shizuoka Sister Cities Association. He just went on a trip with them. Uh, so if you see him at the booth over there, make sure to say hi and uh, ask him what his favorite thing is in Shizuoka was. Um, so he had a lot of fun. I'm super jealous. I helped down the court while he was on. Uh, so, anywho, uh, Tim started the T Smith here after his former life in uh, manufacturing procurement. Uh, so he was traveling all around the world, uh, and his wife cannot drink coffee. So he's away for certain holidays, he started getting her tea gifts. And these tea gifts, he now says, well, that was the most expensive gift I ever gave her. <laughs> because it turned into a business. Uh, so he decided to uh, switch gears and, and uh, completely change what he was doing and start a business when they were trying to get teas, they didn't find anything here in Omaha. So uh, why not change it up and make it so that other people can find something? Oh my gosh, I'm glad that was you and not me. <laughs> Powder. 
And then they would put it into a bowl, a matcha bowl. And as it said, beat with a bamboo brush. So now you see the, the uh, cha sen, the bamboo tea whisk, and the cha wan tea bowl. Um, Song Dynasty uh, tea bowls are going to look darker. That's primarily because the tea that the Chinese were using were um, black teas and they were oxidized. So when those black teas are whisked up, that froth is white. So they wanted that contrast between um, the white froth and the bowl. Now, what you're looking at in Japan is a very green, delicious, delicious, frothy mixture. Um, so now we've got chow wans that are any color, and maybe with a picture painted on the side or something, uh, a, something a little bit wabi-sabi. Um, this one that I have, this is a matcha bowl for preparation for other people, so it has a nice little spout. Um, if you come and say hi, I might bring out my ceremonial grade matcha stash and we can enjoy some ceremonial grade matcha over there. Um, but, so they're grinding the tea down into a powder and beating it with a brush into a frothy mixture for the Japanese tea ceremony. Um, so during that time, so tea actually came to Japan in the late 800s, early 900s, and it was brought with Buddhist monks. So Buddhist monks <coughs> were the ones that were growing the tea and preparing the tea. So uh, later on, you get the codified matcha ceremony. Senno Rikyu was a tea master in Japan that actually kind of codified the tea ceremony, uh, bringing the, the tea hut into, into being. And so then everybody has to duck, make a small bow to get into the tea ceremony. Um, it's so many tatami mats, big, very small space. And prior to Senno Rikyu, there was lots of, of lavish artwork that was in the tea space. Um, but he codified it down to a flower or a small bit of nature to appreciate during your tea ceremony. And a small wagashi, a sweet to have with the bitter of the um, bitter of the matcha. Um, so it's interesting the tea hut itself, actually, that you have to duck to get into. So the Buddhist monks, in a way, were acting as kind of mediators between. Uh, between different clan leaders and generals. So they would sit down and have tea with the Buddhist monk preparing the tea during some pretty tense discussions. So everybody has to show respect to the space and duck down to enter the space and show respect to this moment of drinking tea together. So that kind of helped de-escalate some situations, if you will. The tea itself is amazing because it has, all tea has L-theanine amino acid in it. L-theanine amino acid, they've done studies now to show that L-theanine helps your body to process cortisol. That's your stress hormone. <laughs> um, so, Tea has caffeine, matcha has a lot of caffeine. It also has a lot of L-theanine amino acid. So you have this, this sense of awake and aware, 
as well as relax and calm. That's a part of why the Buddhist monks were were growing the tea as a as a meditation aid. There's study. There's um, there's stories of um, the Buddha um, actually discovering tea and finding that it helped him to stay awake during long hours of meditation. So that's kind of a little fun fun aspect of tea, and a part of why I drink tea myself. Um, I feel like we can all use a little bit of help with stress once in a while. <laughs> um, so later on, that's, that's the uh, early 10 to 1100s, 1200s, uh, and in 1300s, uh, so the Chinese were brewing tea loosely. Um, at that time in China, there was a, so there was definitely an interaction, a cultural exchange happening between Japan and China during that time. Um, so the Japanese the, would discover all of these new ways that, that the Chinese were processing and treating their tea to, um, to make their tea. The emperor of China did not like how tea was destabilizing his currency. They would, a lot of people would take tea in payment for goods and services in place of the emperor's currency. So the emperor decided, the emperor in China at the time, decided that he would start drinking tea for its appearance. He wanted to drink tea that was lovely and have a sensory experience. So then in China, you had the Gong Fu style of tea brewing um, and appreciating the shape of the tea leaves and the smell of the tea leaves, the smell of the tea leaves after they've seen water. And so the Japanese saw this new way of processing tea and right about then, you have isolation era. So then the Japanese are producing their own tea, but the information exchange stopped. So then you have uniquely Japanese ways of producing, processing, manufacturing tea that were not happening in China. So they're preserving all of the healthy benefits in their tea. And so there was uh, one young man that had the great idea to use steam to process tea. So green tea, it is unoxidized. So when you cut an apple open and leave half of it to sit, like my kids do, um, and they forget about it, it turns red. It rusts. That's oxidation. So green tea is not oxidized. Black tea has oxidized. So what they need to do is prevent that oxidation process from happening to preserve the tea and keep it green. In China, what they do is they uh, will fire the tea. They'll roast it over uh, a wok, and, and um, it's a dry heat that they use to kill an enzyme in the tea leaf that interacts with oxygen to oxidize the tea. In Japan, they decided they're going to steam it to kill that enzyme. So that steaming actually preserves more health benefits in the tea leaf. And, it's, and then you get these lovely grassy, spinachy, seaweedy flavors in Japanese teas. So the Japanese are steam dehydrating their tea. Um, talk about an oxymoron, but it works. And it works really well. So 
Um, so then we have this amazing sencha. Uh, so if you come over there, you'll see a sencha shinro here. It's beautiful. This is um, an early picking. So it's sencha is a spring and early summer tea. Uh, then you get bancha, which is late summer and fall picking. So sencha is a really good quality tea. This sencha shinreoku is amazing. It's nice and bold and grassy. That's probably my favorite part of Japanese teas is how grassy they are. I really like that fresh from the lawnmower bag smell and taste. It's delightful. Um, so the Sencha Shinroku has that fresh from the lawnmower bag quality for me that I really, really love. Um, the same time that they are making Sencha, they make Kukicha. So Kukicha is all the twiggy bits, the center ribs of the leaves, the stalks, the stems. Um, and they separate those twiggy bits out using static electricity. <laughs> How ingenious is that? I just think that's amazing. I geek out on this stuff. <laughs> but those parts of the tea leaf are a little bit lighter, so they're a little more susceptible to static electricity. Um, so cool. That one, so we talked a little earlier about L-theanine in tea. So this tea, green kukicha, it's lower in caffeine because it's all the twiggy bits and doesn't have all the green, greener bits. Uh, and it's higher in L-theanine, amino acid. So it's lower in caffeine, higher in L-theanine. It's perfect for me. If this is one of my favorite teas also. All of them are my favorite. Green kukicha. And you can come come taste some too over at the booth. I'll, I'll make sure I'll steep some for you. Um, so yes, and our kukicha comes from Shizuoka as well. Uh, these are both uh, Yamakita varietal. Uh, there's a few different varietals in Japan. The main varietal of tea plants in Japan is the Yamakita varietal. However, there is the Gyoku. Gyoku varietal um, makes Gyokuro. Um, Gyokuro means jade dew. Um, and this one, I. Uh, it's buttery. It's buttery and grassy. It's so yummy. Um, this is almost too nice for me to drink on the regular. <laughs> Actually, it is too nice for me to drink on the regular. Um, my everyday drinking tea is green kukicha. It's so good. But uh, this is when I'm feeling super fancy. Um, I don't have this one today because our supply is super low. Um, but instead, what I did was I brought shincha. Shincha is even more amazing and less available. Um, and it's a uh, shincha means new tea. So that is the very first harvest of the tea plants that they will do early in spring. So generally, shincha, they're harvesting at about early April. So, um, and our Shincha, the Shincha Hishiri, comes from Honyama in Shizuoka Prefecture. Um, in Honyama, there's the Abe River and its tributary. Every morning, there's fog that rolls off of the, the Abe River, and that fog protects the tea plants. And because of that fog, the, the tea will increase their chlorophyll. Um, it also increases the umami characteristic to the tea. So a lot of these, you will really taste this umami characteristic in them. 
This one, the, the Shincha, it's just a little bit more so. It's lovely. Um, and then, so, isolation era Japan, about 80% of the population were rice farmers. Tea itself was really, for the most part, out of reach for those regular rice farmers. So when they did get tea, they would extend it with, what do you have as a rice farmer? You have rice. So then we get genmai cha. Genmai, toasted rice, cha, tea. So toasted rice tea. Um, so this one, it's a later sencha picking, almost a bunch of nut bites. Um, and it's mixed with the toasted and popped rice in there. Uh, if you see those little white bits that look like popcorn, it's popped rice. It's not popcorn. <laughs> um, but the one that I have over here, it's a blend of genmaicha, and it's dusted with a little bit of matcha on there. So that's fun. And then we get to hojicha. I'm sorry, this one's from Gucci. <laughs> um, but this is a bancha. Uh, bancha's later picking. Um, so this one, the bancha is going to have um, not as as much of the grassy characteristic. So the Japanese have played that up and toasted it, roasted the tea at a very high temperature. And that roasting process actually breaks down the caffeine molecule. So hojicha is extremely low in caffeine. Um, hojicha, uh, because it is so low in caffeine, it's practically a decaf. But we can't say that it's decaffeinated because it hasn't been decaffeinated. It's just been roasted. Um, you can actually steep this one at boiling if you would like. It's so roasty, toasty, and delicious, and just warms your heart. It's lovely. Uh, that roasting process releases a, a compound called pyrazine in the tea leaf. Um, they've done studies to show that pyrazine is very beneficial to your heart health. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. So, um, I talked a little bit about tea preparation. Um, so, we can't use the matcha bowl and the whisk for all of these lovely loose leaf teas. Probably my favorite teapot is a Japanese teapot. Probably my favorite, no, this is my favorite actually. Um, this is a kyusu. So this is a traditional Japanese style teapot. It's a side handle, kyusu side handle. Um, and it's just marvelous in that it has a, an OB style infuser. OB meaning the belt. Um, so the infuser, it's permanent in there. It's a little screen that goes all the way around the inside of this teapot. Um, and so you just toss your tea leaves straight in there, pour the hot water in there, and steep it. And when we steep it and pour it, pouring from this teapot, you start with a line of cups. So however many cups for people that are drinking tea, you're going to ensure that everybody's cup will have the same strength of tea by starting with one cup, tip, 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 and go down the line, and then you go back, tip, 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 and then the last one that got the weakest tea in the at the beginning has the strongest tea at the end. So that's how it. That's how you even out the strength of the tea between everybody's cup of tea. This is only five ounces. I misuse this tea. I, I 
make myself really, really strong tea. And then I pour hot water over it. <laughs> um, I have three kids. I got in this habit because I would never have a, a hot cup of tea. I would forget about it. And so I would make a tea concentrate. And then I would have this much tea concentrate on the bottom of my cup, and then I'd have my hot kettle going and pour hot water <laughs> to the top of my cup. Um, it works for me. It's not necessarily what you're supposed to do, but <laughs> it helps me out and uh, all the distractions that I get. Um, but anyway, so uh, if you have any questions on any of the teas, please let me know. I'm really excited to share tea with everybody. I brought my, my uh, private stash of ceremonial matcha, so please come over and have some matcha with me. I, I like matcha, I love matcha actually, but I don't like to drink it alone. So I need people to help me drink my matcha. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Not you. <laughs> That's my daughter. We're out of tea again. You're out of tea again? Yeah, okay. we need you to speak some more. We need you to speak some more again. Well, I'm, I'm down to just a few minutes. I'll be out there. Anybody have any questions? All right, well, come visit me. Um, and thank you.